Tenakoto, ko Christian Shotaho, no Taputeranga ho, Tenakoto Katoa. So I'm welcoming you as the chair for this webinar. I'm Christian Schott. I'm from uh, the tourism group at Victoria University. I am currently living in mighty Taputeranga on the south coast of Wellington. And it's a real pleasure to, to host this webinar because I think it definitely resonates with people. We, we are looking at a uh, situation which is unprecedented. We have never been in this situation for, and hopefully we'll never be in this situation again, but it is a situation which is on the one hand, very challenging and is tragic as it wipes through the, wipes out people across the world. But it is also an opportunity where we can think that as we need to stop and re-envision and reimagine what we want the tourism industry in New Zealand to look like, this is really the opportunity because everything had to be paused. And in this context of really thinking about what we can do with the tourism industry in New Zealand, the contextualization sits around the report by the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment about tourism being pristine, popular and imperiled. So very strong wording and it was very timely when it came out in December 2019. And this is giving us the, the context for this talk. So how can we reimagine tourism in New Zealand ideally sustainable tourism. And it's my pleasure to introduce the three speakers. We have Professor James Renwick, and James has 40 years experience in weather and climate research. His main field is large scale climate variability over the Southern Hemisphere and the impacts of climate variability and change on the Pacific, New Zealand and the Antarctic. James has been a lead author for the International uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for many years, including the sixth assessment report to be published in 2021. He was awarded the Prime Minister's 2018 Prize for Science Communication and has recently been appointed to the New Zealand Climate Change Commission. And um, James is based at, sorry, James Renwick is based at Victoria University and he is talking about climate change and the future of tourism. Second in our lineup will be uh, Professor Susanna Becken from Griffith University. And Susanna Becken is a professor of sustainable tourism at Griffith University and the principal science investment advisor in the visitor area in the Department of Conservation. She is also a vice chancellor's research fellow at the University of Surrey in the UK. Susanna's mission is to undertake robust research on some of the pressing problems facing the tourism sector and working with key stakeholders towards developing positive solutions. And she will talk about sustainable tourism and COVID-19 and the question back to basics. And we have from the deep south, Professor James Hyam, who is a professor in the Otago's Business School at the University of Otago. His research interests address tourism and global environmental change at the global, national and local scales of analysis. And in pragmatic terms, his working hypothesis is that the COVID-19 recovery pathway must lead towards the climate safe and resilient tourism system that we need and want. And he will be talking about a global prototype building a 21st century post COVID tourism system. So I think you will all agree that these three people are truly experts in their field and they bring very nice and enriching and diverse perspectives. And before we ask James Renwick to kick us off, I would just like to um, remind people that there is no opportunity to throw questions into the, the panelists talks but instead to please use the Q&A function where you can post your questions and they can also be upvoted. And at the end of the three presentations, we will take the opportunity to go through a Q&A where we will target the questions at the appropriate speaker or put it out for everyone. Okay, so thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to introduce everyone. 
and I hand over to James Renwick with Climate Change and the Future of Tourism. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, kia ora koutou. Uh, thanks to uh, Victoria University Wellington Business for hosting this event today. I think it's really great. So I, um, I guess you might say I'm the bad cop. I, I'm giving some of the bad news in a way up front. So as you can see, my title there, Climate Change and the Future of Tourism. And my goal here is just to, to put a few things on the table about um, where we're at with climate change, what the future may hold, and, and what are some of the implications, not, not just for tourism, but really for um, global society, domestic society, and um, how we live our lives in the future. So if we could have the next slide, please. So one of my favorite pictures here, this, this is a graph of carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere over the last 13,000 years. Um, the reason I show this graph, it it's mostly comes from ice cores in Antarctica because we only have a, a record from the atmosphere of the last 60 years or so. But the climate system and the carbon cycle on Earth operates on this kind of time scale. 10,000 years is, is quite fast for a rise in carbon dioxide like we've seen in the last couple of hundred years of nearly a 50% increase on the pre-industrial level. And this stuff warms the atmosphere. You put more carbon dioxide in the air and the surface of the earth gets warmer. That's a bit of basic physics. So we've, we've bumped all this carbon dioxide into the air and unless we find ways to remove it through some new technology, it will be there for thousands of years. So we have already changed the climate significantly. And if we don't stop adding to the problem like this, uh, we are going to see significantly more climate change um, in the fairly near future. So just click, please. So we've had this rise in carbon dioxide since the start of the Industrial Revolution, nearly 300 years ago. The first half of that rise took about 230 years. And the second half of the rise, just click again, uh, has taken only 30 years. So in the time that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has been doing its work, we've actually doubled the size of the problem. So while there's been a lot of talk about action, there hasn't actually been any action yet. Um, and we're now at a point where there's more carbon dioxide in the air than there has been for several million years. So this is a pretty, again, another unprecedented situation for humanity. And if we keep going the way we are now with the amount we put into the atmosphere, and you click, uh, we'll find that in 10 years, we will have locked in one and a half degrees of warming, which is the threshold of the Zero Carbon Act. This is the, the, um, the limit we're not supposed to go beyond, or the Paris Agreement really talks about two degrees of warming, um, somewhere between 1.5 and 2. And if you click again, that, that two degrees of warming at the present rates will be there, or be very close to it within 20 years. And final click on this slide, in 40 years, we'll be at three degrees of warming. And those sorts of levels of warming, we're talking about seriously dangerous changes to the climate in terms of how humanity um, operates. So we just go to the next slide. So these are the kind of things we're talking about with climate change. So high temperature extremes, heat waves, droughts, um, big risks around food security, so crop failure, uh, and also water availability issues. As the sea levels rise, because the water's warmer partly, we get more and more coastal erosion and damage to coastal infrastructure. Um, warmer temperatures and drier soils lead to greater increase in, in the risk of fires. The photograph there is actually from the Port Hills in Christchurch a few years ago. And at the worst end of the scale, and I'm not saying this is going to happen in our neighbourhood necessarily, but that picture of the burning tank down in the bottom right there is from, uh, was taken in Syria a while ago. And the Syrian civil war was partly triggered by a very severe drought that occurred in that part of uh, the Middle East over a, a number of years. And it's well known that, that the severity of that drought was um, enhanced, increased by the climate change that we've already seen. So the more warming we get, the more of these kinds of things um, are likely to happen. And when you have um, problems with food security, 
uh, and resource availability for large populations in places like Asia, let's say, um, you know, this can lead to major issues for human populations, displacement because of sea level rise or uh, inability for populations to feed themselves are going to be potentially at least really damaging to society and really damaging to the global economy. Um, so if we go to the next slide, the World Economic Forum uh, thinks about all this stuff uh, on a regular basis. They put out a global risk report every year. You can look it up online. Um, and one of the graphics they have is this, this one I show here. They have a, a two-dimensional plot of the likelihood of different um, risks. This is risks to the global economy. And then the impact, that's the vertical scale. And you can see from this year's report in the top right corner, these are the things that are most likely and most dangerous. The very top one is failure to act on climate change, plus extreme weather um, and biodiversity loss. All three of these are tied together. And according to the World Economic Forum, which is a bunch of central bankers from around the world mostly, uh, they're saying that these are the biggest risks to the global economy. Our water crises are in there too. And over towards the left-hand side, we've got infectious diseases. So the, the pandemic we're experiencing right now certainly is up there in terms of impact on the global economy. But in terms of you know, looking to the future, uh, we may well see another outbreak down the track, but climate change is happening right now and is ongoing. So um, it's considered to be far more likely to affect the global economy than um, than another pandemic. Oh, and, and further over on the left, we've got nuclear wars, which of course are extremely damaging if they happen, but relatively unlikely. So and it's hard to overstate the risks for the future in terms of climate change. And that's really the message I want to give, not so much about tourism, but we really have to think about what society will be like in future if, if action on climate change does not pick up a lot of speed in the next, well, next year or two actually then it's very hard to say what the global economy and what travel and um, tourist activities, what, what are they going to look like? So just to run through a few ideas before I wrap up, if we go to the next slide and click again. So obviously tourism is a significant sector of the global economy, but it does depend on affordable and reliable international travel, something that's come along, I'd say, just in the last 30 years or so. Big growth in the middle classes in some, what were at least, developing countries, such as in China. Um, and it's well known that air travel is a, a big emitter of carbon dioxide. The, the best way to improve you or increase your own carbon footprint is to fly more. So, as a part of the global total, we're only really talking on the order of 5% right now. But as other sectors decarbonize, emissions from, from flying, from travel, from tourism are going to become more and more important. And there's going to be more pressure put on reducing those. And unless we can develop, let's say, electrically powered long haul aircraft, it's, it's going to be a major issue for the sector, I think. Uh, click next. So we really, to meet this 1.5 degree, threshold or to stop at that threshold, emissions globally really have to start reducing no later than this year. And they are reducing because of the pandemic, because of all the lockdowns. Uh, but that is just not a sustainable way to go. Um, we have to find ways to capitalize on the reductions we're seeing this year and move rapidly towards renewable energy production and so on. So all of these shovel ready projects people talk about um, we have to make sure we choose ones that um, move us in the right direction in terms of energy, energy use. So, you know, the risks to the global economy if we don't achieve reductions and really get on top of the problem. I mean, I think the best way to express it is, you know, COVID-19 on steroids. It could be a lot worse than it has been this year if we don't watch out. So final slide. Um, I just click through, I think. So... International tourism, I think, could come back as it used to be. It's possible if several things happen, if the airlines resusc resuscitate, if travel remains affordable, and if there aren't other, you know, major hurdles down the track with the global economy. Um, but I think tourism is likely to become more local, more domestic. You know, I think the global economy might 
might permanently shrink a bit and there'll be more emphasis on um, sort of the detail, the authentic experience closer to home than zipping off to Paris to see the um, Eiffel Tower, for instance. And, and in New Zealand itself, you know, coastlines are eroding, glaciers are melting, etc. It really is going to change what New Zealand is and what it means to us and what it means to possible visitors from overseas. So, you know, I, I'd like to pose the question, is tourism a sustainable or reliable part of the economy at all? And I'll, I'll leave it right there. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, James. And that's a nice note to finish on. And I'm sure that we'll get the discussion going. And hopefully the, um, the transition has worked well and everybody has been able to, to hear well and seen the slides um, clearly. Um, I would now like to shift over to another person who is um, an expert in climate change, more in the tourism context, but has also done a lot more work uh, more broadly into sustainability. So Professor Susanna Becken from Griffith and DOC and the University of Surrey on the sustainable future for tourism in New Zealand. Thank you, Christian. Kia ora, everyone. And um, James, we couldn't have planned it better with your segue to my talk. Because <laughs> I think the short answer, of course, is that I think tourism will play an important role in New Zealand for the economy and society. The question is how big and what type of tourism. But so I will, I will um, give you some of my thoughts and, and also then looking forward to where James Hyam takes it and where the questions go. Um, I invite everyone in maybe first slide, Christian. Um, I invite everyone to go back to the basics, back to history. Um, and you can see a collection of old tourism advertisements. But what I wonder if um, everyone can try and remember the first time they actually um, went on an aeroplane. Um, because my, my hypothesis is that it is, has been such a significant event, such a meaningful experience that people probably can remember their first flight, who they went with, where they went, how they felt, etc. cetera. Um, and, and then maybe think about how many flights you've taken since then, and it all becomes a bit of a blur. Um, and I can hear some people probably talk about my carbon footprint, which um, obviously this current crisis gives us an opportunity to rethink some of that. So, so back to basics in terms of why do we actually travel? What does it mean? And, and where has this whole machine of tourism, I might call it, that's why we talk about an industry, not so much a social activity anymore, it's an industry. Where has it taken us? And uh, next slide. And I'm a little bit cheeky by um, putting up stereotypes of images here. So I know that um, cheap um, low cost airlines, um, Freedom Campus, cruise ships. So, I thought I'd just sort of trigger a little bit of um, a, a red rag here, but, but of course people say we have democratized travel and that's fantastic and the masses can, can go everywhere. Um, but there's obviously, and, and I think before the COVID crisis, it became very clear and in many parts of the world um, and in New Zealand, um, that it was a bit too much of a good thing. It has become quite commercial. Um, it's become faster and faster, a um, lot of external influence outside from the communities and, and really market driven often by global companies and, and public sectors have often stepped back. So my question is, what can we learn from that? Where do we not want to go back and where can we maybe have the, the good things that tourism offer? And on the next slide, um, and uh, sort of linking a little bit to what James said, um, you can find on the internet a lot of discussion on how is COVID comparing with climate change and does it crowd out climate change or the opposite, etc. Um, I try to take a positive spin here to say, okay, it's, it's a huge opportunity. I, in some ways, I would actually say it's a rehearsal because if you looked at James's slides, the climate crisis is potentially, well, in fact, it is much bigger because it will literally affect everything and everyone and not just particular groups and industries, but it, it will change the whole planet. So it is, it is bigger. Uh, we need to make sure we learn from this. The good thing, I think it shows people understand that everything is connected and also everyone's, every, everyone's washing hands has an impact. So don't say um, in the future when you jump in the car, oh, it doesn't make a difference. Everything helps. Um, the chart on the right hand side is really interesting um, because it shows forecasts of where the CO2 emissions for this year are, probably four to seven percent lower. And that's the kind of annual reductions we would need to see year on year 
and, and you can just now think about, oh my God, how hard was that? And um, hopefully it will happen in a more planned way, um, <laughs> but there will obviously be significant change. I just put a few points down there from the recent budget in New Zealand um, that go a little bit in that direction to make sure recovery is, is sort of green, but there could probably be a bit more on the climate front, but there's, there's money left. So here's my hope. Um, next slide. I thought before we talk about the future, let's have a quick look at where tourism in New Zealand was at, so some diagnostics. And while we're definitely not Bali or the Costa Brava, um, I think New Zealand has seen the start of mass tourism where in some ways um, there's been diminishing returns on more and more volume. So it has become volume driven. Um, you can see the arrivals here. And then next, you can see the spending, um, which even though we try to get high spending visits, it has actually stagnated. And if you think again, you see the just the 2009 value, which is inflation adjusted. So in, in real terms, we've actually gone downhill in terms of spending. Um, next, we've also seen um, a reduction in jobs per uh, 1,000 arrivals. And some people might say that's a great thing because it's called, called labor productivity. So we've rationalized the way workforce. Um, but is that is that a good goal? And the last one, Christian, is the value add that has been created by tourism and every dollar spent. And again, it has it has stayed stagnant. I checked Australia; we're actually better than Australia, so that gave, that gave me a bit of joy. But um, it hasn't increased, and that's really probably what we want to drive. Um, next one. Okay, so really briefly um, before I give a bit more detail, what should the future look like? I think, um, and James made it really clear, it has to be low carbon um, because otherwise the future <laughs> isn't, isn't very great. It has to be circular economy um, because we just cannot afford, afford to waste resources. It has to come from bottom up with, with the communities having a say and many voices being represented. Um, nature has to sit at the table and New Zealand has a great precedent with the Whanganui River having legal status. Um, so that's, that's already really leading. And we have to move from this industrial extractive model to a more regenerative one. Next. So now I'm um, borrowing from the um, PCE report that was mentioned in the introduction and this little equation, which I find actually quite helpful. Um, or, uh, Essentially, what the report argued was that the, the environmental pressure by tourism, and you can replace social or cultural as well, is a combination of, of the footprint of each activity, so the green box, what people choose to do, the yellow box, and how much volume we pump for the system. And I think the green one, in some ways, we agree. So that's, for example, the efficiency of buildings or transport. So, so that's a matter of, of sort of efficiency programs or conservation. The politics um, starts, and that's why I put a circle around, the, this is essentially the value versus volume debate. So, so what do people do and how, how big a number of tourism would be a good one for New Zealand? And I think that's a little bit um, taking your question further, James, on is tourism playing, what, what role of tourism do we want in New Zealand? And that inevitably links to volumes. And if we arrive at a point where we get actually increasing returns on either decreasing or stable volumes, I think we'd be in a very good place. And to qualify what return means, I think we're talking value or values. So dollar might be one value add, uh, regional development, contribution to well-being, to heritage, etc. So I think that's really important. And then, so my first question, slightly provocative, would be in the next 12 months, we've got the chance to really find out where are the absolute low value segments that we do not want to regrow. And I've got two candidates for that. And that might be if I had research dollars to give out, I would get a study into freedom camping and really investigate what's the value of it. Um, and we might be surprised and cruise ship tourists. So that'll be my two suggestions um, on that front. Next slide. Um, decarbonizing, obviously, I think that's because that is the, the big crisis looming and we have legislation and tourism will have to fall part, uh, form part of that. So we got to do something about it. And I tried to sort of simplify it into a shift, replace, reduce. And um, for example, for aviation, and it's happening in Europe, shifting, for example, well, away from aviation onto land transport. So both Germany, France, um, investigate or, or invest now into rail away from air. We can obviously do that here in New Zealand. Um, 
there's an electrification of land transport happening, uh, we can look at replacing the fossil fuel. And, and we all know aviation is the hardest, but um, there is work underway on electric aircraft for short haul or synthetic fuel for longer haul. There's a cost element to that and, and again a volume, but in theory that's something I think New Zealand as an island we, we need to invest in. Um, or if that doesn't work, reduce volumes. And just to show you that my analogy of back to those basics works for accommodation, move away from air conditioning, get a ceiling fan, or if that's still too much, open the window. So that's kind of the logic. Um, so I just want to conclude with my final slide, um, the beacon of hope. And I think this is a beacon for hope, not only for New Zealand, but I think the role we play in the moment in the world um, as a country that seems to get a few things right and has the right ingredients on the table. And, and that's new economic thinking, new models that are being discussed in various parts of government, but also in the industry, actually in the tourism industry around whether it's downward economics with planetary limits, whether it's well-being, whether it's um, prosperity without growth, circular economy, all of those different ways of looking at what do we want out of an economy and, and integrated this way. I like this one um, very much. It's, it's, a Mari, it's a Mari version of the donut um, where we can actually integrate that Mari worldview that's already much more interconnected with economy, humans, nature, culture. It's, it's all, of course, connected. We can't just cut out one or maximize one and, and then don't worry about the rest. Um, things are place-based. That's why I keep saying work with the communities. And I think we need to really drive innovation in tourism. And that could be technological, but also service delivery experience, integrating culture and nature back into what we call not tourism industry, but maybe the phenomenon of travel. So I think that's where I leave it, Christian. And thank you, everyone. Perfect. Thank you very much, Susanna. Um, that also makes a very nice transi transition to the next speaker. Um, and clearly that, that donut is something to ponder. Maybe we can revisit it in a bit more detail during the Q&A to have some time to, to look at it in a bit more detail. So a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor James Hyde from Otago University. And he's looking at a global prototype building a 21st century post-COVID-19 tourism system. Thank you. Take it away, James. Tanakoto katoa. Kia ora, everyone. Uh, thank you, Christian. Thank you to colleagues at VIC for organizing this, uh, this really important event. A quick hello to uh, friends and colleagues around the world who have been in touch with me in the last 20 minutes to say we're online, despite our various time zones. Uh, it's a great opportunity to uh, share some thoughts, so thank you very much. Uh, I want to use my 10 minutes or so to uh, begin with the Parliamentary Commissioner's Report. Um, which Christian uh, briefly introduced at the top of the hour. Uh, the Parliamentary Commissioner's report highlights problems associated with sustained high tourism growth. Um, it notes that tourism has eroded the very attributes that make Aotearoa such a nice place to live in uh, and also a nice place to, to visit. Uh, it's also placed enormous strain on popular locations uh, that will only get worse if we um, continue under business as usual. So some of the issues highlighted by the Parliamentary Commissioner include infrastructure constraints, resource pressures, crowding, waste. Susanna's mentioned freedom camping. It's, uh, it's uh, a classic example, I think, of uh, one of the issues that has, uh, has been vexing for many in this country. Uh, it talks about concentration and bottlenecks uh, that has uh, compromised social license uh, in parts of New Zealand. It highlights pressures on the conservation estate uh, which is valued for its natural beauty, its relative emptiness, its natural quiet and qualities of solitude. Uh, and it highlights the vulnerabilities of the tourism sector. Um, also at the global level, um, it uh, addresses carbon constraints and our reliance on markets that are on the other side of the world to where we are as a destination. Um, I want to propose that the Parliamentary Commissioner's report calls for us to move away from volume-based what uh, we might call 20th century tourism. Uh, it claims that Māori perspectives and principles need to be at the very centre of this shift, as Susanna has mentioned. Um, of course, that report was released on the 18th of December last year, right at the very end of last year. No one at that time could have foreseen 
the uh, crisis that uh, loomed in the new year. The situation we face now, uh, if you go to the next slide, Christian, is that we are facing a black start. And a black start is uh, a term that's used in the energy sector to describe trying to restart a system after a total shutdown. As Christian has mentioned, uh, our current circumstances are completely unprecedented. And it's actually very difficult to restart a system when it's been completely shut down. That said, COVID-19 has also offered us a very rare opportunity to ask some important questions, reflecting the uh, issues raised by the Parliamentary Commissioner. Those questions might include, what is the tourism that we want in the future? And we need to ask this of all stakeholders and all actors. We need to know what are the parts of tourism that we want to retain, and what are the aspects of, the, of tourism that we don't like and we want to resolve. Uh, do we want to return to normality? Uh, we can think about these questions while reflecting on our COVID-19 lockdown experiences, which have been fascinating for all of us. They have included uh, working virtually, less time commuting, less consumption, less congestion, less noise, less pollution. And we've also heard reports of more family time, more downtime, more bird life more birdsong we're hearing, uh, and less of mental independence. This is a funny one, but I was really struck by an item on the news a week ago that reported a young woman living in Auckland who was high risk under COVID-19 because of pre-existing conditions, very highly reliant on Ventolin inhalers because of her asthma. And what the lockdown proved to her, what it showed was that she actually began reducing her ventral independence because of la lack of car fumes, to the point that during lockdown, she actually stopped using the ventral inhaler altogether. And these are some of the insights that I think we need to inform what we want the future to look like. Do we want to return to the relentless pursuit of growth? Uh, or are there alternatives? If there are alternatives, what are they? What are they? We need to think about this really carefully at this time. So this run raises fundamental questions. Should we, can we use this opportunity to disrupt the industry as described by the Parliamentary Commissioner? There are probably two schools of thought. Um, and if you are looking at the slide with uh, the WTO and the WTTC, they represent uh, a school of thought, which is that we need to recover as quickly as possible. And these organizations uh, focus very much on people, on uh, saving jobs, on restoring traveler confidence, uh, on recovering quickly and returning uh, to growth in tourism. The alternative school of thought, uh, a more critical perspective, as we are addressing here and now, is how can we reimagine the future of tourism? I think the opportunity exists in New Zealand for us to not only lead the world in terms of our management of the COVID-19 pandemic, but also to lead the recovery from the crisis in terms of perhaps the Trans-Tasman bubble, um, reopening our borders. Uh, we may be uh, one of the first in the world to restore safe travel, but we might also lead the world in terms of rebuilding tourism for the future. And I now want to think about that because 20th century tourism has been based on moving uh, very long distances, very quickly, for very short durations, high carbon transport dependent, low value, high impact. Susanna has uh, already addressed this. We need to rebuild uh, the sort of tourism that we've actually been talking about for a long time. And I want to think a little bit about 21st century tourism. We're actually already two decades into the 21st century, so we better get on with it. Um, precious time has been lost, but 21st century tourism is gonna be very different. It has to be climate safe. As James has said, we must decarbonize. It needs to be far more sustainable. We need to protect our environment, our cultures, our communities, our resources. And it also needs to be resilient. Uh, this will not be the last Bioshock that we face. There will be other pandemics. There will be earthquakes, extreme weather events, and such like. We need to be prepared. And we need to rebuild tourism at a range of spatial scales. Um, so at the global scale, the Parliamentary Commissioner's report uh, calls for attention to the global scale of uh, tourism impacts. Uh, climate change has been described as a pandemic in slow motion, um, but 
Susanna has alluded to this point. A paper was published in Nature Letters a couple of days ago titled How the Coronavirus Has Slashed Carbon Emissions. And the scale of reduction of emissions this year is similar to what we need to be able to sustain year in, year out, in order to meet the Paris climate objectives. However, if we look at the uh, 2008 global financial crisis, emissions quickly recovered and returned to business as usual. We cannot allow this to happen. We need to uh, have climate conscious tourism policy. We need our tourism policy to recognize that there is a high carbon cost associated with tourism, that uh, tourism GDP comes with a high carbon footprint, uh, that we've got some real challenges in decarbonizing tourism because uh, although the industry has achieved some gains in decarbonizing, it's been overwhelmed by growth in visitor volume. Uh, and we need to benchmark ourselves against other sectors to highlight how we're tracking and how much more we need to do um, to uh, mitigate uh, our tourism carbon emissions. We've already seen that transportation is at the absolute heart of this problem. Uh, so we need to tackle aviation. Uh, I have a slide here uh, that uh, looks at some of the things that we might want to start thinking about quite quickly. We need to think about inbound travel, outbound travel, and we also need to think about domestic regional uh, air travel dependence. Um, the current technical regime is locked in. Uh, there are no silver bullets on the horizon. We are dependent on long haul markets. We are going to have to uh, get uh, offsets. Uh, we're going to have to get tourists to pay to offset their emissions um, if those emissions are unavoidable as they are in the case of air travel. And that uh, offset funding has to be invested in the development and maintenance of sustainable tourism systems of this country. We've got to have low carbon transitions. But it's also interesting to see that uh, airlines, many airlines now are um, dependent on government bailout packages. Some countries are adding so-called green conditions to bail out terms. The French government has banned Air France from serving domestic routes that compete with high speed rail. Uh, that's an interesting move. Obviously they have uh, um, infrastructures in place to allow for these modal shifts. We need to get a move on with uh, facilitating these sorts of modal shifts. Also in France, taxes to support low carbon uh, investment in uh, alternative transport modes. The other thing that's come through is the growing importance of uh, domestic tourism. And in many parts of the world, domestic tourism is the um, foundation of uh, the tourism industry. We have neglected our domestic tourism too long, and we need to that transform that into a long-term commitment to our domestic and regional markets. Next slide, at the national scale, uh, the focus here needs to be on uh, national transport networks. The cruise sector needs to come under close scrutiny. It has a very high environmental cost. We need to move from domestic flights and private vehicle use uh, to invest in uh, sustainable transport infrastructures within this country and to encourage businesses to innovate. Finally, um, the local level, we need resilient uh, and regenerative tourism at the local level. The problem we have is that tourists in most cases don't pay for the resources that they consume, whether it's water or waste or infrastructure or, or solitude in the national parks, the burden typically falls on ratepayers. Uh, and some of the resources that tourism tourists consume were actually never intended for them to consume at all, like going to uh, quiet beaches that are now being overrun by tourists to see uh, populations of wild animals. So we need businesses to innovate in regenerative tourism. And there are some great examples of this happening now. Businesses that engage in funding wildlife science, predator control, um, uh, wildlife hospitals, plantings, beach cleanups, offsetting, uh, donating to uh, conservation causes, signing petitions, all sorts of ways that we can refocus on regenerative tourism. And we need to be thinking about that. My last slide uh, summarizes the different scales uh, at which we need to act to uh, pursue 21st century uh, tourism as, uh, as I'm beginning to uh, explain it. Um, we need to think comprehensively about how we act at different scales of analysis to uh, enact uh, a new form of tourism. Uh, my final slide suggests that uh, we have an opportunity for disruption. 
historians argue that the 20th century actually began in 1914, which uh, obviously is the date of the First World War, which swept away the old Victorian ways that had continued into the 20th century. I'd like to think that in future we might reflect that the 21st century of sustainable tourism uh, began in 2020 with the COVID crisis. Um, it's been said previously that uh, it's only in crisis that we can produce real change. But as Milton Friedman said in 1982, uh, when the crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around at the time. So we need to stop talking perhaps so much about the problems. They're well rehearsed, we know them well. Uh, we need to make sure at this time that good ideas are available. Um, and I'll finish by saying that the Parliamentary Commissioner will produce a second report with policy recommendations. And uh, I would argue that there has never been a more timely and important report uh, to make policy recommendations to government as to how we might tackle um, the issues that we face and uh, move towards 21st century tourism. Uh, kia ora, thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you very much, James. Um, I, I didn't mind read James's thoughts. I did have a, a cheat sheet, but it may have been slightly out of touch when I changed the, uh, the different uh, slides, but hopefully that worked. I would love to be able to read James's mind, but I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> okay, so now we shift over to the Q&A sessions. If you have additional questions, please add them to the Q&A. And I will hand over to Evie and Colette to read out the first question, please, and to direct it at the panelists. Wonderful. Thank you, Christian. Uh, we have some wonderful questions going over on the Q&A chat box, which you are able to continue to ask questions as we do this process, as Christian said. This first question I'm going to direct towards James Hyman as it touches on something you just talked about, and that's the idea of industry and government working together. Uh, you referenced that in your discussion on aviation and made reference, for example, France. So your words, please, on how you see industry and government working together, please. Well, we've got uh, a great track record in this country of uh, industry and government working closely together. Um, and uh, that uh, is continuing through the COVID crisis. Um, the tourism industry, Aotearoa, um, leads the, uh, the industry voice in this country, uh, working closely with uh, the key ministry, the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. Uh, and obviously, Tourism New Zealand uh, faces some uh, huge challenges at the moment to refocus from its uh, extremely successful, historically very successful international marketing campaigns to uh, focus uh, on the domestic market. Um, and there's a, a, an enormous challenge there because it's been neglected for a long time. And uh, we're, we're really starting from scratch in how we uh, are going to go about um, marketing to domestic tourists. So there are lots of players in the tourism system. There are lots of actors, there are lots of stakeholders. Uh, I've named three of the key uh, groups, obviously. Um, but uh, more broadly speaking, I think Susanna has alluded to this, we need communities involved. We need uh, the public voice. We need uh, uh, the um, key players in the tourism system as very widely defined to, uh, to be empowered to uh, have a voice on what the future of tourism might hold. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question, but i um, happy to speak more on that. I think it definitely adds some nice context. It needs a comprehensive stakeholder framework to not just be talked about, but to be applied, I think, where every member of that stakeholder framework has a, has a voice. But I think Zuzana might also like to speak to this. Um, yes, I was just thinking that, and also because I saw the original question, which did refer also to other countries, developing countries in particular, not only New Zealand, and, and I've worked in a number of um, also, for example, Pacific Islands, my impression is that sometimes the evidence based is lacking. And I think even some of the questions here where, for example, how valuable is domestic tourism? How valuable is cruise ship tourism? Where governments might develop certain policy because, and so this is not New Zealand, this is another place that I'm having in mind by saying there's external interests coming in, convincing government you need a big cruise ship terminal because it's good for you and there's not enough uh, data evidence insights into what that actually truly means in terms of value generated for the country 
And so policies or things are permitted, um, often under the banner of aid projects that actually ultimately undermine, I think, the future of the country potentially more. And that's because they weren't researched well. So, so that's, I think, about having really good evidence about the true benefit and cost of, of certain tourism developments. Thank you very much. Um, can I now shift over to a different focus, which is what is Maori values proposition that could contribute to the future of sustainable tourism? And James Rinmake is, is nodding. Would you like to start with this one? Sorry, uh, you just cut out there, Christian. Did you direct this to me? No. James trying. Rinmake. Sorry. Um, thanks, Christian. Yeah, that's a really good question, and I think it's it's very pertinent. The whole, um, the way we think about the environment really would benefit from taking a totally Mataranga Māori viewpoint. It's, it's really about living, well, Suzanne showed the, um, the donut, or the, the Māori donut, or a Māori donut. I mean, I, Absolutely right. We have to live within our economic, uh, economic and ecological means and take a really holistic view of who we are and how we fit in to the environment. So I think taking a sort of te ao Māori approach to tourism and to economic activity generally would be hugely beneficial to the environment and, and ultimately to the economy and its sustainability. Over to Zazana. Um, thank you, and I'm by no means uh, an expert in this space, but my understanding is that the Maori view is obviously a much more balanced one, and we've obviously really prioritized the economic dimension in the past. And an interesting fact um, that I learned recently is that there's no Maori word for external cost. Um, this is a very Western term because we produce external costs. Um, in the Maori world, there's no such thing because whatever is an output becomes someone else's input. So I think there's, there's a lot of um, guidance we can take from that. Excellent, thank you. And I can see that in the questions, um, one about economics is rising, which was just talked about. So let's address that one. Where does economic sustainability fit into the mix? Can I chuck this um, in James Hyam's direction? Sure. Um, it's a really important question. You know, we're focusing a lot on, um, on non-economic factors that uh, have become really front of mind and are really important. But um, tourism is, of course, uh, also an economic activity. So, uh, so it's, it's a really important question. But when the question is raised, um, it kind of takes me back to uh, James Renwick's presentation. Uh, because if we don't get on top of climate change, then um, our economic prosperity and future will be will be lost. Um, so the stakes are very high. And, um, you know, I think uh, certainly in the short and medium term, there are going to be fewer tourists. Um, there are going to be fewer tourists flying in the air. There are going to be fewer tourists flying long haul. Um, uh, particularly given the, uh, the uh, crisis that uh, is, is confronting the aviation industry. Um, Susanna has alluded to the importance of um, value added. Uh, she's alluded to the importance of optimizing our tourism markets. So one of the challenges that we face, and we need good science to inform decisions in these areas, is what do discrete markets bring to the table? What do they bring in terms of their environmental costs and their environmental burdens, but also what do they bring in terms of um, their economic impacts to the, to the New Zealand uh, economy, uh, but also what do they bring to uh, regional dispersal and to, uh, to regional communities and regional destinations. Part of the problem we've faced in the past is uh, concentration of tourism and huge pressures on bottlenecks or high profile destinations, while many other parts of the country are largely empty. Um, so we need to think about optimization. Um, and uh, we need to think about how we optimize our key markets in ways that clearly uh, include a carbon footprint. Uh, a tourist coming from Australia, Eastern Seaboard Australia to New Zealand, has about 13% of the carbon footprint of someone coming from uh, Europe. Uh, so we can think about how we optimize markets uh, in environmental, in social, 
and in economic terms, and that is going to be really important uh, in the future. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm mindful of time, but I, you know, it would be great for all panelists to talk to this point. But I'm interested in a comment that Susanna made earlier about Freedom Campus, and I think that ties into the economic discussion. And I heard on the ray on the news, and this I couldn't verify this anymore, that um, someone in Queenstown, I think, put out a, a petition to ban freedom camping once we come back from lockdown as a as a fresh start. And then I saw that the person withdrew it because she had re re received threats, and on the basis of that, withdrew that petition. What does that mean about? tourism in New Zealand and what does that mean about how far these practices have established themselves and how many important stakeholders are invo involved. Basically it was economically driven, the petitioner said, why was it then withdrawn? You, you, just, browse, uh, you, you just browse for a moment, did you want me to provide some thoughts. I thought Zuzana would be excellent for this, yes. Okay, um, so I think what does this show? It's obviously, it shows that freedom camping is an extremely polarized political ball in New Zealand. Um, <laughs> that's number one. It confirms what I suggested earlier. We actually need some really good data on, it could actually be that only certain types of freedom camping generate greater cost and benefit and others are actually really producing that value that I talked about. I, I actually um, could see even how that emerges. Um, this is why I think also about the question um, uh, uh, concerning the economy earlier, we need to actually be a bit more clear what we mean by the economy. And of course, in the past, it's maybe maximizing um, profit for a relatively small, this is also questions around distributions and what are the metrics we're looking for? Is it employment? Is it equitable distribution? And what are the models that even say with something like, like backpacking freedom camping, we can actually drive some of those economic outcomes by people, for example, engaging in, in activities that generate high employment in the regions, for example. So it, I guess what I'm saying, it's not quite as black and white um, as I maybe also try to make it up, but, but this is where we need to be quite clear on, on what is the value proposition of tourism, what's the policy goal, and, and how do we get there. Thank you. And I suspect also, you know, the, the democratization of travel comes into this, where we, the International Freedom Campus do have a particular group that is uh, less financially resourced to do it. At the same time, they provide a good resource for the, the low skilled workplaces around New Zealand. It's a really complex and interesting question that I've been also following for a while. But definitely one that I think needs to be discussed as we re-enter into this reimagined world. It's our opportunity. And if I can change over to a question um, that is directed to Luzana or James, your thoughts on managing tourism in our hotspots in national parks such as Milford, the Glaciers, Tongariro National Park. And Susanna had started answering that um, in the chat version. So I'd like to hand it over to James Hyam to add his thoughts. Sure, thank you, um, and thanks for the question. Uh, it's, a, it's an issue that's highlighted by the Parliamentary Commissioner, our most uh, natural and, and beautiful um, res resources have come under enormous pressure. Uh, the Tongariro Crossing is a, is a classic example of this. Um, my own sense is that um, we need stronger uh, government and policy in, in all of these areas. Um, we need to uh, realize that, um, that uh, demand uh, can very easily overwhelm supply of such uh, valuable experiences. Uh, and we need to manage those experiences very, very carefully to, to safeguard them. Um, I've said previously that uh, in many parts of the world, uh, you pay to go into national parks. Uh, there are booking systems. There are user pay systems. No one complains. Uh, I think um, when you go to beautiful national parks, um, it's, uh, it's, it's worth paying a sum for the, for the absolute privilege of doing so. Um, uh, 
I read a year or so ago, um, I'm, I may be corrected on this, that the Great Walks in New Zealand operated a financial cost to the Department of Conservation, that the cost of actually developing and maintaining and providing those experiences on the Great Walks isn't recouped, even though we now have a tiered uh, costing system um, for, um, for um, such experiences. It seems to me absolutely remarkable that the taxpayer would be effectively subsidizing what is our absolute premier national park experiences um, in, uh, in, the, in the Great Walks. Uh, so we need to think about um, how, how we meet the costs of uh, providing these sorts of experiences and uh, how we meet the costs of uh, maintaining the very resources that uh, tourists use and consume when they're here. Um, so those are some initial thoughts. I might just add really briefly, um, because both James and I mentioned the word innovation in our presentation, and this is where I think we can we can do with a bit of innovation, for example, working, I don't know if any of you have seen these pop-up hotels, I've seen them somewhere else in the world, so they are temporary structures that you could put up um, in a scenic spot, for example, for tourist accommodation, quite, quite fun funky design, they could be operated by a third party, um, and for example, the Department of Conservation works with them, um, leave no impact. So I think, in, and because we talked about um, economic opportunities, so here's, a, here's a, an opportunity for an entrepreneur to come up with ideas of how we can use maybe conservation land in, in different ways that allow impact and generate economic activity. I, th I think there's room for that. Thank you. And in response, this will be our final question, in response to a question about few suggestions for implementation issues. Um, the question basically asks, is it going to be a, a best, all the ideas that we previously had approach, or do we need to adopt a more nuanced approach, for example, to freedom camping and to cruise, cruise tourism? So <clears throat> the question itself, I think, is a bit uh, too detailed to go into, but could each of you leave us with one core implementation suggestion that you could put to government that you think is going to be a core part of reimagining New Zealand post COVID-19. And please don't all just talk about climate change. <laughs> Can we start with James Hi uh, sorry, James Renwick, please? Certainly, and I won't mention those two words. So I, I think for me, and that graphic that Susanna showed before about the tourist numbers versus the tourist dollars tells a real story. I think we need to try and move towards a quality over quantity model where perhaps less people come to New Zealand, but they come for a really rich experience and for some depth in the experience they have, I can only imagine that tourism has become more superficial over time, more people traveling, but less, less of a, meaningful experience let's say so i'd love to see some marketing effort coming from government agencies and, and the business selling the idea of new zealand as a destination where you can really have a, a high quality experience thank you and susanna yes yeah, so here's an idea um so when you go to bhutan you actually have to hire a local guide now i haven't been to bhutan because i'm too scared to fly into that airport um, but anyway, I would love to have a local guide. And so, so there's actually places in New Zealand where this is starting to happen with, with a representative of, of a local EV to generate employment, get the right stories, get people to take time. And I think why not um, certain types of tourism, whether it's cruise ships, um, at the value, they have to, when they come on shore, they have to have a guide. I don't know. That's just an idea. Excellent. Thank you very much. And James, hi. I'm. Thank you, Christian. Uh, a couple of concluding thoughts uh, to address this question. Um, I think uh, we've alluded to uh, some of the um, open questions, some of the things that we need to know more uh, about. Um, we talked about optimizing markets, for example. We need good science to inform decision making. So uh, the onus will be on, uh, on the right research questions being addressed rigorously uh, to inform um, pathways forward. Um, I actually think that forums like this, these sorts of webinars, are a fantastic opportunity to share ideas, um, to put forward the sorts of ideas that might need to be available to uh, inform the future. And uh, to repeat what I said right at the end of my presentation, the Parliamentary Commissioner's re first report was extremely 
comprehensive and really uh, identifies the challenges that we face. Um, his second report uh, to make um, policy recommendations to government, I think will be an, a critically important pathway forward um, to the strong government and the policy initiatives that we need to uh, create uh, the new tourism that we want for the future. Excellent, thank you very much. I'm very mindful of time and I'm mindful that people have to um, get on to other um, aspects of their lives. Unfortunately, we don't have time to, to address more of the Q&A questions, but I would just like to take the opportunity to firstly um, thank Abby and Kurt who have been doing a lot of the preparation behind the scene, to thank uh, Ian Yeoman, who has actually done a lot of the, the preparation of pulling this together and giving it a theme, and for inviting me to chair this, but I have to, I have to say I can't take much credit for much of what happened here. I just try to help bring it together. So thank you to Ian. And um, before I thank the speakers, also very quickly, a, um, basically an advertisement for the upcoming webinars that try and continue in a similar, in a similar way, trying to bring together different perspectives. And they are on the 3rd, June, the 10th, and the 25th. And for details, just go to the Wellington, Uni Wellington University website or for some and then events. As you can see at the bottom we asked to call Victoria, but it's not in the in the URL. And then I would also like to thank um, our excellent presenters for sharing their their expertise. Thank you to James Renwick, thank you to Susanna and to James Hyan. And um, it was a, a pleasure to host the seminar. And that's all, folks. Well, thank you all.